I'm Brian Hickson, the Neuroscience Director for the Brain Performance Center. My background is in neuroscience, specifically in the fields of EEG brain mapping and neurofeedback training. I've performed over 10,000 brain maps in my career, working with the Department of Defense, working with pro and Olympic level athletes uh, to our three centers throughout Southern California. I'm a brain health expert, contracted with AARP for their Staying Sharp program, which is a program specifically designed to help you stay sharp as you age, as well as give you the latest research on the prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I also am the co-founder of Brainspan Laboratories, which is a brain health blood test used by nearly a thousand doctors throughout the U.S. So we have three centers throughout the uh, Southern California, uh, one at Oaks Christian School in Westlake Village, another one in Calabasas at Calabasas Pediatrics, um, and then as well as Engaged Therapy um, in Westlake Village as well. So I'm going to attempt to, in the next 10 minutes, give you a full understanding of what brain mapping is and how important it is to objectively measure our brain health, just like we measure our heart or any other organ in our body. Okay. So we're going to start with just a quick background on brain waves. Your brain uses brain waves to communicate uh, different functions throughout the body. It uses the slowest brain waves. These are just under 4 hertz, which are just under 4 cycles per second, basically. Uh, these delta waves to regulate your autonomic nervous system. So these waves are going all throughout the day and night. They regulate things like sleep, your digestive system, uh, your circulation, your hormonal regulation, immune function, all those things. The brain commands all those things and controls those throughout the day. Next are your theta waves. These are 5 to 8 hertz. These are slow waves, but uh, they're, they're very drowsy waves. They're fatigue type waves. They're great for daydreaming, for going to sleep, for waking up in the morning, uh, but they're not good for uh, thinking and processing. So we want those to be a transition wave to come up, but then to come back down to a nice normal resting state. Uh, and then you have these alpha waves that are produced, and these are nice neutral waves that allow us to calm down our brain and relax the brain uh, to reset after something and, and kind of get a hold of ourselves. And then we can be very present in the moment, but then we need to shift back into our more focused thinking, which is our beta brain waves. And beta brain waves are a little bit faster waves. These waves help us get things done, help us to focus, to concentrate, to encode memories, executive function, all those things that are about problem solving and getting things done. And then we have our high beta waves. High beta is typically more for you know when there's a threat to us or when we're in our fight or flight type states, um, when there's urgency in a matter. And so we use each of these different frequencies or different brain waves in different amounts throughout the day as we need them. What we want though is each of these should come up when we need them and then come back down. They shouldn't stay stuck up high. Just like you know, these are like gears in a car, you want them to be able to shift through those, not get stuck in producing one. If you're trying to think and concentrate and encode memories and pay attention and you have these slow theta waves stuck up high, it's like having a 40 pound backpack on when you're trying to hike. If you're trying to go to sleep at night and your beta waves or high beta waves are processing way too high, then you can't sleep. Your thoughts are just going so fast that you can't fall asleep. You can't shut down the brain to be able to, again, relax and go into those deep sleep cycles. So we want all these to increase in what's called amplitude and then come back down. This is very much like a resting heart rate. Okay? And what we're going to see is that EEG to the brain is very much like what an EKG is to the heart. We know when we measure heart health that we should have this nice resting state. It's going to increase, your, your heart rate's going to increase as you run or stress your heart, but it should return back to that resting state. And that's the same thing we're looking at with the brain. The brain's electrical activity, those neurons fire as you think faster, as you have urgency, as you have acute anxiety, you need to get something done, but then it should return back to a resting state. When acute anxiety turns into chronic and those brain waves start firing all the time and they don't come back to that resting state, that becomes a problem. That causes a lot of, it's the basis of a lot of anxiety disorders. Um, and then again, if that, if that resting state of the brain's electrical activity becomes too low, it can cause problems too. Everything from attention disorders uh, to memory encoding uh, to just general sore processing, brain fog. Um, and then we need to look at how the, the sleep's regulating as well. So again, what we do with an EEG is we measure the resting state of the electrical activity of the brain, very similar, like I said, to the resting state of the heart. We want it to be in this nice normal range. 
Um, so this is what a brain map looks like. When we get a brain map, we do this. It's about 30 minutes of recording of electrical activity, and then it produces these brain maps, which each of those different waves I talked about, those delta waves that regulate sleep in, in the autonomic nervous system, those theta waves that regulate your attention and, and being able to you know, transition through those theta so you can process information, those alpha waves, which regulates our ability to just calm down and relax and be present, those beta waves right here that are really allowing us to process information and, and have problem solving abilities and executive function. And then our, um, our high beta waves, which are fight or flight waves, you know, we don't want those to be stuck too high, we want those to be at a normal level. So when we look at a brain map, again, if we get delta waves that are stuck way too high, that means your brain, those, those waves that control your autonomic nervous system, is in a hypervigilant state. Those can cause, that can cause a lot of problems throughout the brain. That can cause problems with inflammation, where your brain can overreact to simple foods like gluten or lactose or different foods that, that cause the brain. Again, the brain overreacts with inflammation, and that's the symptoms we feel. Um, it can cause things like uh, insomnia, where it's, it's difficult to fall asleep or to stay asleep. The sleep cycles can be off on it. Immune system dysfunction. Things get into the, the system and affects those delta waves, and then it dysregulates the immune system. That immune system has to be able to heal with proper activity in the delta waves and proper sleep cycles, um, and it, it can, things can linger for a long time if you're not uh, really you know, healing that immune system and, and maintaining it in the proper resting state. Uh, hormonal regulation from PMS and irregular cycles can cause problems, fatigue and brain fog, um, all the way to you know, bladder sensitivity and things too. All those things are autonomic nervous system. And typically, so many people come and say, you know, I've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, I've been diagnosed you know, with adrenal fatigue and all these things, where typically it's the delta waves that are putting too much stress across the body. And those will affect the thyroid, those will affect the adrenals, those will affect sleep, those will cause brain fog. Those will cause all those things. So we need to be looking at the brain activity that controls all those things and looking to see if there's a dysregulation in those. Um, also, as far as sleep cycles, you have to get into the deepest level of sleep, that non-REM sleep, to allow the, the vascular system of the brain to slightly shrink down and it allows the cerebral spinal fluid to come through the, uh, the brain and basically cleanse the brain from the, the toxins and the, the regular metabolic waste, which includes plaques that build up during the day. Your brain, as it's in normal use, will produce a certain amount of plaque, but in deep sleep, it should come through, the cerebral spinal fluid comes through and removes that, cleanses that out. So if we're not getting into deep sleep cycles, we're not getting rid of that plaque and that plaque's starting to accumulate and build up, which can cause a lot of problems in the long term, decade after decade, towards things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but also um, in the short term, things like memory and brain fog and you know attention issues and all those type of things can occur from uh, poor sleep cycles. Um, and then we go to those theta waves. If we see that your theta waves are stuck too high, again, that's like having a 40-pound backpack on as you're trying to accomplish things like focus and attention. This is very typical in attention disorders where there's too much theta right over the attention network, which stops you from processing information. It's slowing down your ability to process information. It's, it's putting pressure. It's, it's fatigue waves. It's slow, sleepier type waves right over your attention network. And uh, it makes it very difficult with executive functions, uh, with attention, um, you know, with all these type of things, working memory, planning, uh, you know, all these functions. Um, and then we have uh, alpha waves. So alpha waves are great to, to bring up when we're meditating or we're being very present in the moment, we're relaxing for a little bit, then they should go back down and we should progress into problem solving and getting things done. We wouldn't get much done if we were in this meditative state all day long. And that's what happens when the brain comes up into that alpha and stays stuck up there, it stays stuck in a neutral state. And when you're in that neutral state, everything seems overwhelming. It can cause depression, um, overwhelm anxiety, lower motivation. Uh, the brain's just stuck in that neutral. And what we tend to do is start withdrawing from things because it seems so overwhelming and too much work to do something or to meet with this group of people or to do a new project. And so we just withdraw from it, which causes the, the lack of engagement and slower processing overall. 
Um, and then our beta waves. Our beta waves should come up as we need them, uh, but then they should come back down uh, as, we, as we get done and we relax our brain. We want to, it's like working out a muscle. We'd want to flex it as we pick something up, but then relax it as we let it recover. And same thing as we're working, we're getting things done, we're processing, we're problem solving, those beta waves are fine to be up. But at night, when we're trying to go to sleep, when we're relaxing, we need to be able to bring those back down so our brain doesn't stay in these loops and get stuck and not, you know, and we need to be able to shut down our brain and give it the recovery it needs so that we have the energy and stuff to go the next day. So it can cause things like anxiety, it can cause obsessive thinking loops and, and compulsive tendencies and all the way to addictive behavior, uh, excess worry. And then it can cause physical things like migraines and headaches, uh, teeth grinding, where those temporal lobes are just putting so much pressure across the, uh, the jaw all night long and you know, constricting those muscles. And uh, it can cause that teeth grinding and jaw, TMJ and jaw clenching, things like that. Um, and then it does the same thing in the neck and the muscles in the back. Um, you know, a lot of people that have this can go get a massage and it feels great for about one hour and then it constricts all back, the neck and the, the back. Um, and that's because the, the activity in the brain is constricting it. It's not relaxing. Um, and then we can also see the, the, form, the fight or flight waves, which are your high beta waves, and uh, which is very typical to get stuck in things like post-traumatic stress. So when there's an intense stress over a period of time or a very specific traumatic event that happened, um, that can cause things like panic attacks and aggression and anger and rage and fear, um, you know, addictive behaviors uh, where you just can't turn off the brain. And different things can trigger it as well. Um, so we can look at all those things and then from a brain map we can understand is this diffuse activity across the whole brain we can look at nutritional deficiencies uh, cellular problems uh, genetic things that can cause that uh, we look at things like magnesium deficiency if it's high activity across the whole brain um, magnesium regulates the flow of calcium and calcium fuels a lot of that activity across there so magnesium sits on the outside of that, that calcium ion channel and basically regulates the flow of calcium into there so we can control the fuel source uh, that's causing a lot of anxiety sometimes with it with magnesium we can look at neuroinflammation and look at the the balance of omega-3s to 6 within the membrane of the cells we can look at sleep cycles we can look at heart rate variability and understand if someone doesn't have the the skill to actually activate the parasympathetic nervous system and we can train them to do that so they can actually lower their activity and uh, which decreases the the stress levels and activity across the brain we can look at diffuse low activity and understand is there a omega-3 deficiency that's not allowing for enough connections across the brain to produce enough electricity? Is it a methylation problem where the ATP in the cell is not producing enough energy within the cell to actually activate that we need to, what we need to? Is it excess uh, palmitic acid which can clog up the cell and start to cause problems as well as can lead to things like insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes? Um, you know, is it glutamate deficiency um, which is usually from, you know, a lack of, of exercise, more aerobic type exercise? exercise. And then we can look and see is it focal. If it's very focal or localized activity, which a lot of times it is, I would say about 50% of the time it's it's a localized activity, is this from a past concussion? Is this just a certain area that you know, you're continuing to stress that part of the brain over and over? And when it is, we can do things like uh, neurofeedback, which is EEG biofeedback, a, a way we can place a sensor directly on a, a, a portion of the brain and actually train that one area. It's like physical therapy for the brain where you can localize an area of the brain and change it and reduce activity or increase activity if we want. So there's a lot of things we can do once we can see this, but you have to measure the brain. You know, an objective measurement of the brain is so important. You know, so many people have questions, you know, how do you know if you're getting the right sleep cycles? How do you know if you have nutritional deficiencies that are affecting your brain that by doing something now might prevent so much from the future, uh, of causing problems in the future? You know, did my brain heal from a, a past concussion? So many people, the brain just adapts, it compensates, and it goes on. And symptoms go away, but you're putting so much stress on one area of the brain and one area is uh, atrophying. Um, you know, how can I lower my risk of dementia? You know, people have all these questions. By doing a brain map, we can answer those questions and we can start to understand the physiology that's actually leading to sometimes the behavioral side, sometimes the physical uh, symptoms of sleep quality, of brain fog, migraines, of, of uh, you know, things like adrenal fatigue, you know, all those things, as well as anxiety, attention disorders um, as well. So, you know, a brain map is affordable. It's under $500. Everybody should do this. 
every five years at least. There's not one person from, we can do it all the way down to six years old, up to 90 years old. Uh, a brain map is so important in understanding your brain health. You know, it's under 45 minutes. It's very simple to do, non-invasive. There's no electricity put in your brain. This is like having a stethoscope on your brain. You put 19 stethoscopes basically on your brain, the sensors, EEG sensors that record the electrical activity coming off your brain. And then we put it in and compare it against a database, which compares it just to your own, your own uh, gender and your own age. And it understands where you are compared to that database and knowing if there's way too much uh, electrical activity or way too little. Um, it's very actionable too. We create a plan that can help you change it. We can do a remap afterwards and understand and objectively measure those changes by the plan that we give you based on this. So again, 90 to 95 percent of people can improve their brain health, but you have to measure it to be able to see the specific deficiencies so we can address those and change those and then a lot of behavior changes as well. So if you want to do a brain map, please call one of our centers um, throughout uh, Southern California and we can arrange that and uh, you can sit down and we can, we can spend an hour going over the brain map and coming up with a good plan and knowing what we need to do to improve the physiology across your brain.